Thanks, Ross. Uh, it's good to see that everyone's saying we should invest in more R&D, so that's, uh, that's healthy. Um, we've got time for uh, some questions, and uh, you'd know the drill by now. If you've got a question, please go up to one of the microphones. Um, uh, we've got our first question up there, number three. Uh, Ian Baker, in, Ian Baker from uh, NT Farmers. Is the problem of R and D one of quantum or quality? The the, ex the expenditure on R and D is 800 million, which represents about 15 percent of GVP in agriculture. As a farmer, all we see is research stopped. Is is the problem one of quantum or one of quality? Is that uh, is, do you? Want anyone in particular to answer that question or...? Well, Peter, we'll Peter throw it alluded open. to something that uh, maybe the research effort is spread. Maybe that's the problem. But 15% spend is a big spend. Is it necessary to get more money or do you just need to spend it better? Thank you. Peter? Well, I think, you know, there are, there are the two aspects and you've got to be... Make sure you're making the most of what you've got on the, on the quality side of things. And it is, it is true that... Um, Nowadays, we're spending that money on a broader range of activities than we had in the past, and you know that that's for good reason. Um, Society is interested in a broader range of things, but we need to make sure we're understanding those decisions when we're making them. In that, they do have uh, on-farm implications. The um, the quantum question is a bit more difficult um, because obviously there are you know competing priorities across the economy for um, public funds. So, um, you know, while there are, uh, you know, while there are obvious benefits to investing in public R&D, um, there are benefits to investing in other things as well. So, it's, uh, you'd be surprised to see um, a large increase in R&D spending over a long period of time because that's very expensive. I think the, on the quantum side, it's more about getting... Um, private investment into the Australian R&D system anyway, and, and that links back to some of those things I was saying about regulatory hurdles and getting the incentives to invest right. Robert, is it about, um, is it about the fact that we might have already got the, easy, the early gains, the easy gains? And it it can paid? be, and I think it's uneven across industry sectors. I see some industry sectors who really underinvest and some that maybe overinvest. Uh, Yes, I think uh, a lot of the easy things have been done, but I think we've got a lot of technology we can apply. I, th I think it's about the goals, and, and uh, you know, I think we still, in many cases, spend too much of our research dollar doing more of the same of what we've always done, rather than trying to do something different. So it's about whether we just want to be more and more efficient at doing the same thing, or whether we really want to change the game. And I think it's always about how we prioritise our research expenditure and, and continuously challenging ourselves about how we do that. Ken? Just uh, along, along the same lines, um, uh, the, uh, the, the quantum is perhaps not inside your control. That, that decision will be made wherever that decision is made. What you do with it, though, matters a lot. And, and it, is, it is in part focused, but I, I'll come back to this issue of collaboration. Um, there's an awful lot more um, good research that could respond to widespread demands, but today's and tomorrow's. If, if there was more collaboration across research institutes, uh, there is tremendous opportunity um, uh, internationally. There's a growing interest. Um, it doesn't need to take, that aspect doesn't need to take more money. It needs to take uh, a little bit more listening and, and, and a little bit more talking. Okay, we've got another question there. Yes, thank you. Uh, David Walker, National NK Network. Uh, Karen Schneider this morning suggested I re-ask my question here. I think. Uh, Peter's probably certainly referred to it, the, um, the lack of uptake uh, as being one of the factors, but perhaps we could focus a bit more specifically on, on whether the uh, declining, uh, the slowing rate related to productivity uh, increase, how much that's due uh, to the uptake by farmers of sustainable practices, uh, and, uh, and to what extent is it related to a slowdown in the rate of repair of the, of the resource base in farming country. Um, and given the part answer of Karen's this morning was that uh, part of the reason for drop into uh, productivity is um, the run of bad seasons we have. I suppose the question is begged 
uh, is the run of bad seasons the new normal? And, and then, so perhaps Peter and, and Ross also might comment on those. And also, Ross, I think you raised an interesting point. Would it be, uh, would it be fair to say that our investment in, uh, in better in improved management uh, should be an investment in the farmer rather than an investment in the farm and allow the farmer to then invest in his own farm? Thanks. Thank you. Well, a lot of questions in that, but we'll kick off with Peter. OK, so um, there are a few questions there, and I, I think the one of the important things to get across is how um, difficult it is to pull apart the different things that are affecting um, productivity growth. But um, if you look at some of the OECD work, um, what they talk about is sustainable productivity growth. So it's, it's always important to keep in your mind this idea that uh, some of these measures include some things and not others. So um, having uh, good productivity growth numbers, if it's not including or accounting for reductions in the quality of the resource base, um, that's, that's something you would want to take into account. Now, our, our numbers, um, we've included uh, rainfall in the numbers in the past to look at what difference that makes. Uh, we're currently investigating whether we can include the quality of land uh, in the analysis, but as you'd appreciate, that's, that's quite complicated because the quality of land varies considerably across the country and what happens in one area uh, completely different impact to what it might have in another. So while there's no um, statistical measures of what's going on at the moment, I, I agree with your point that basically we, we should be making sure we take account of what measures there are of the quality of the natural resource base in interpreting the productivity numbers. Um, in terms of uptake of technologies, um, one of the things we, we are noticing, and it's in cropping um, primarily, is that the, while the production frontier is being pushed out, um, and that a lot of those technologies are um, consistent with um, better natural resource management, so for example, um, no-till and minimum-till technologies, there's a widening gap between the average farms and the best farms. So there, there would appear to be some issues in terms of um, capacity to uptake existing technologies. Some of the work we've done uh, for GADC in the last few years sort of highlighted that the nature of new technologies is requiring farmers to have uh, more skills than they used to have. So they're just more complicated. Uh, you, you need to be more computer savvy and literate and uh, that, that is an issue in some cases. But at the moment, we've really only got sort of some partial uh, evidence, but it is something that uh, we should be thinking about as we go forward because some of these natural resource pressures are likely to become more important. Ross. Yeah, good question. Uh, obviously, the seasonal history influences farm profitability and, and farm profitability then affects productivity. So if you've had a series of crook years, you just don't have the cash surpluses to invest in some innovations, say controlled traffic farming, variable rate technology, putting on large amounts of lime in Western Australia to alter soil pH so that those lands are more productive in future years. If you don't have those cash surpluses then you're between a rock and a hard place. You don't have profits and then you also don't have productivity because you don't have the capacity to invest in innovations that deliver that. So, so seasons really do matter. Um, when it comes to the issue of R&D investment, I think in the future one of the most scarce resources in agriculture is farm management skill. Um, and, and therefore, are we investing not just in scientists through R&D, but are we investing enough in maintaining or improving the human capacity of the farmer? But certainly in Western Australia, where we've had our drought pilot review, uh, Mick Keogh headed up that, and one of the findings from that was that a lot of farmers hugely benefited from the farm financial training that form part of that drought policy. 
so that those farmers saw their skill as managers as being a weakness in their business. And so I think that's an area where we can deliver productivity and profitability gain is through changing the nature of the human capital that underpins farm businesses. Thanks, Ken. I'd just like to underscore the, the last comment you made. I don't think it was really a question as whether or not you, it makes more sense to invest in the farmer than the farm. I don't think this is unique to Australia. Um, I, I don't even think it's unique to agriculture. I think it's always a very good idea uh, to invest in people um, and give them the ways and means to do whatever, whatever it is they decide to do. Thank you. I've got a question down the front. Jonathan Blip from University of Western Sydney. Question um, to Peter and potentially to Robert as well. Peter, during your talk you touched on the huge power that the general public has on regulations and uptake of innovation, um, especially with GMOs, um, having lived in a number of countries where um, GMO trials get ripped out consistently. Um, what, is the, what is your position or idea on um, the role of public education? Yeah, I think the, it's basically around that debate that the community has regarding um, acceptance or otherwise of new technologies and that it, it, needs, to, it needs to be informed on, on both sides and that's um, you know, something we have to work on, I suppose, to make sure that uh, the, inf the information the general public has is, is the right information and that it's, that it's balanced so that when we're making decisions about um, what to allow and what not to allow, we're, we're clear on what trade-offs we're making. What I'd add to that is I think sometimes the uh, uh, adoption of technology and also the, the public acceptance uh, can reflect the, the quality of, of the outcome. So uh, I think sometimes we don't adopt technology because it's fairly incremental and really it's not that great. Really good and compelling technology does get adopted. And it's the same, I think, in, in the GM debate. Some of the early generations of GM plants have been useful, but not so compelling. If we have uh, products for which there's an absolutely compelling case, I think we'll get public acceptance. So it's about the quantum of benefit that's derived from the innovation. OK, we've got a question up the back and then down the front. Uh, Rod Glass is my name from the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, a question uh, just, just based on, on I think one of the things you talked about this morning, Professor Kingwell, was, was around um, government support, particularly state government support. Um, we've talked today about the bullish nature and the potential for agriculture in the country and the fact that uh, Barnaby Joyce put up this morning about probably one of the most least supported ag industries in the world. We, we look at the success of the RDCs from the 80s through where, where we in fact have ag research linked to 0.5% of GVP. My question is around, uh, given the level of, of possible growth and the support that's required by industry, are, are we in fact able, because of the, lack, the declining level of state government support, able to meet the needs of producers um, from a biophysical as well as a financial and economic source sense? Thanks. Thank you. So, Peter, do you want to have a crack at that one? I thought he was actually asking Ross that question. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I suppose there's, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's been debate around um, the, uh, I suppose, reduction in state funding, especially for extension type activities. Um, and again, some of that work we were doing for GRDC, there were, there were mixed, um, there were mixed signals around that. Um, in different parts of the country. Some, some growers thought that um, this was a, a disaster and that um, they weren't getting the service they used to get. Other growers thought that this was the best thing that ever happened because it meant that um, private provision of services that they, um, that they really needed was, was, was provided at a much higher level. Um, and I think you'd get a different story in the, in the livestock sector so I think that's one of these debates um, we go back and forth on for a while, but um, at the end of the day, it, pr it probably comes down to uh, how is that service best provided? Is it provided 
um, best by um, a public uh, agency or is it best provided by the private sector or, or is there some mix? Um, I suppose that's all I've got to say. Ross, you've been pretty close to the experience in Western Australia on that. Yeah, well, that, that was uh, really a question, the same question I was trying to ask this morning is that um, there's been a lot of commentary about the, the options for the future and how favourable are the opportunities that face Australian agriculture. The question I ask is, is not to question those opportunities but to question our capacity to deliver on those opportunities. And I think that was Matt Lineker's question that just because the opportunities exist doesn't mean they exist for Australia. So uh, the question I ask is, what's the policy settings, what's the commitment by government and industry, what's the actions that will actually deliver on ensuring those opportunities become real? Um, and if you look at the evidence over recent years, you, you would have to ask, certainly at the state government level, that change in funding is not assisting in those opportunities being grasped. Um, I'd, I'd probably just add to that that um, there is mixed evidence, I think, and, and the R&D corporations and the state governments and, and the federal government uh, collectively are, are, are looking at that and have a, a program of work to look at the long-term impacts of these changes in funding models, etc. Just down here. I'm Kazim Saeed with the Pakistan Cult Agricultural Coalition. Uh, my question is for Ross Kingwell. Um, you have a very um, nuanced data set and uh, one of your resounding conclusions is about training, the value of training uh, for productivity growth. Um, there's, there's clearly two sides to that. One you spoke about is how after getting training, a farmer is able to discern between uh, what innovation to pick up, et cetera, and how to evaluate. The other side is um, what kind of absorptive capacity uh, somebody has for the training itself. Um, is there, and I'm curious, is, is there anything out of your work that talks to that, to understand you know, if levels of education, et cetera, are giving higher returns. Sure. Okay, so what we did find was that a level of education was important as a determinant of the farm family's human capacity. So the more education, usually um, the better was that family at being able to handle data sets to deal with electronic innovations to deal with you know, massive information sets um, to logically and, and clearly assess strategic as, as well as tactical options for their farm business. Um, the, the other issue is just the internal knowledge that a farm family generates. Uh, effectively, there's an apprenticeship system that sits underneath Australian agriculture with sons and daughters of farmers learning a great deal about agriculture in a very informal way. And that, again, our data set shows that's a massive resource, just that, that inbuilt, inherent generational knowledge is very important to the success of farming. Right, now we're running out of time. We've got three people ready for questions, so if we just keep it quick. Thanks. Uh, Peter Metcalf, Department of Agriculture and Food, Western Australia. Uh, question to Ross. Um, you talked about uh, businesses that were less secure and others that were going through a growth uh, phase. I'm just wondering your thoughts on uh, whether you see a divergence in policy in terms of how to support those, those businesses going forward and your thoughts on that? Um, let, let me... Um, so are you particularly interested in the less secure group? Both, yeah. Well, if you look at... Um, if you look at the history recently of agriculture in WA, it's certainly true that the businesses that are growing are responsible for an increasing share of the gross value of agricultural production. So I think it's really important that whatever the policy setting is, that it's a policy that doesn't impede 
the success and growth of those farm businesses. Now, be that in the area of R&D, infrastructure, training, th that is a group of the industry that you need to be very mindful of because in economic terms they are going to be increasingly important, not increasingly less important. Having said that, again, if, if I wear the hat of social conscience, you'd have to say that the less secure group is a group of the farm um, population that does need a level of servicing, if only to expedite and, and ease their exit from the sector in a, a socially and financially dignified way. And, and therefore, they may need a different set of policies, but nonetheless, a legitimate set of policies, you know, depending on your political views. Um, but that, so I think you need policies for both, but the policies are liable to be very different. Thank you, and down the front. I'm Beverly Houdeman. I'm a rural financial counsellor in New South Wales. Many of my less secure farmers, shall we say, would be very happy to take up some of the easier innovations and move along, but there is a breakage between the technology and their ability to access it because they don't have mobile phone reception, they don't have internet reception. Yep. And this is not somebody out in the real bush. This is people that are an hour and a half from Canberra. Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, look, I, I, last week I had conversations with several farmers and these were some of the growing businesses and that was their complaint, that um, technologies that I take for granted, they don't have access to. Um, we talk about electronic infrastructure. Well, well that's... That's almost essential infrastructure for metropolitan businesses. It's certainly not uh, part of the infrastructure that all farm businesses can depend on or utilise. And yet, increasingly, that's an essential part of farm management, be it marketing, purchasing inputs. Perhaps it's a, an important area of infrastructure investment, just the same as we traditionally think of roads and railways. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to have to move up to the next one. Mark Swift, farmer from New South Wales. A uh, question for Ross, and if I had uh, time, one for Ken and Peter. But Ross, how did you, de you know, determine that it was causation from training causing innovation and not correlation, yep. given people's attitudes to um, risk and, and progress? Uh, and is there a, for Ken and Peter, please, is there an example of somewhere where there's been a pause, if not a reductive attitude to policy and how that impl or its impact on productivity, where we work with less policy rather than more. Yeah, I, it's a technical issue that maybe we can discuss later, but the sort of modelling approach that we did employ does allow you to impute causality. Having said that, uh, my thinking is that there is a degree of correlation, that is that there are, are people whose appetite for training is greater and therefore they invest in, app, in training and having invested in training, they benefit from it. So, um, yeah. Ken. Um, I, I'm not sure I know what you're after, but let me tell you what I think I know. <laughs> see, how, <laughs> see how that works out. Um, I, I think any, any policy um, that sends a, 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 a disincentive to innovate uh, would be good to do less rather than more. And what I'm thinking about in particular are very high levels of income transfers, for example, which discourage any... Um, any, any needed, any appropriate, any reasonable structural adjustment from taking place, um, uh, production support that encourages people to produce where they should not produce, on land they should not produce on, using water that's not available to them, uh, absent very high uh, electricity subsidies to pump from ever deeper groundwater sources and so on. So I think there are uh, lots of examples of uh, things that one could stop doing and, and get better results. Um, but I guess the, the moral of the story that I was trying to deliver was whatever the level of policy effort determined by whatever combination of factors, 
Um, the mix could do with the re-examination, given the changes in market, given the changes in the, natu in, in the natural resource environment, and just a rethink of, of you know, where are we going as opposed to do we continue policies that have been in place for 20, 30, 40 years? Okay, now I'm sorry I'm going to have to cut it off there. Uh, we've reached time and it's time for afternoon tea. Um, but I would uh, acknowledge that you know, we've had a lot of questions and a lot of interest in this session and so it just reinforces that agricultural productivity is a, is a critical issue. Um, I'd ask you to thank me in um, thanking our, uh, our panellists. Uh, Ken in particular, just before you, the, the story he didn't tell you was that uh, his plane didn't get in on time, he had to overnight in Sydney, he got woken up by an alarm at 3 or 3.30 in the morning and so he's got here just in the nick of time uh, and a big struggle. So. Uh, an extra round of applause for Ken. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we've got uh, afternoon tea outside and then we come back in half an hour for the next sessions.